folks in here. I know we had more registered, um, but I'm really happy to see all the names out there, whether I know you or don't know you. I look forward to, uh, to chatting with you in the chat. Please remember, you can put your questions in the chat um, as we go, and we can pass them along to Mike. So Mike Jones is with us today. Mike, if that is your real name. He's yeah. from uh, Pure Storage. Um, but before that, Mike has been in internet since, as he says, the days of dial-up which may predate some of us on this call, not me, but some. Um, and Mike has worked in the SLED industry, state, local, uh, educational, um, doing uh, security and data protection. He's worked for Symantec and Veritas, and he's now a systems engineer for Pure Storage. Um, and he speaks on ransomware at various conferences. He recently did a similar presentation to this at NiserNet, but we're really lucky to have him here because ransomware, you know, it's a very new thing relative to a lot of security threats, but it's also become, for those of us who pay attention, a fairly constant refrain. And, and the things you need to do remain relatively constant, except that obviously the bad guys are always innovating and working around the latest defenses. So I think it's really uh, important that we all stay current on what these threats are, um, especially since we've been seeing them escalate throughout the election season. Um, and a lot of uh, a lot of other security threats have been escalating as well. So we're really happy to have Mike here today to help us uh, understand the current state of ransomware and also understand how to protect ourselves against it and what the latest best practices are. And ultimately how Pure Storage has solved this problem. They, they, uh, they have a product that, that um, they think is the right um, solution for helping to protect against uh, um, really getting decimated by ransomware. But the truth is we're all vulnerable and we all need to keep, uh, keep current. So, Mike, thank you for being here, and uh, I look forward to uh, passing along questions later in your presentation. Excellent, thanks, Doug. Um, so I have a lot of stuff here. It's kind of a um, you know kind of a little bit of a thrill ride. I, I want it to be informative. I want it to be a little bit scary, and hopefully, uh, you know, and then at the end, you know, give you give you some uh, reassurance that you know everything is is, is safe in the end. Um, so you know, it's kind of to start, you know. This is where we'd all like to be, right? You know, we're all we're all hanging out at the beach with our laptops. And I got I got to go to the Cape uh, last month and, and spend a week and not working. Um, it was nice, but I would love to be able to just go back there and work from there and have a nice calm, calm world. But you know, the reality is that this is much more the world for all of us. And you know, it's it's a new world because of COVID. We're all doing things differently. We're all doing things from home. Um, it was a pretty easy transition for me because I've been, you know, sales offices, companies have been closing sales offices and telling people, you know, work from home when you're not out seeing your customers. So I've been doing this for 20 years, but even for me, it's been a transition. And I know for a lot of people, it's been a much bigger transition and it's hard because, you know, once your work is at home, it's easy to let your work really take over your life. And, and it's hard to draw boundaries and you're managing your time. And everybody wants everything and everybody's trying to do everything. And when this is all going on is exactly the time you're most vulnerable to an attack. So let's talk a little bit about, uh, you know, the, the attacks and, you know, some of the attack services, maybe a, a smidgen of history. So what is ransomware? I mean, this is the textbook definition, you know, malicious software is going to block access. What it really is, is it's a problem requiring you to do an unplanned restore of large amounts of data from most likely products that are designed for other old problems. They were designed for restoring a server or a few emails. Um, and you know, I, I worked a, for a company for that you know that sold that backup and backup exec, and and they were designed for those things, and they weren't really designed for doing the kind of massive restores that you need. Um, if you get hit by ransomware. So, you know, what is ransomware? Well, everybody kind of knows what this is, right? I mean, this is WannaCry. This is probably the most famous ransomware that's out there. And, you know, it's one of those things that when it happens, you absolutely can't ignore it. If you get hit by this, you have to stop and deal with it because you literally can't do anything else. And it gets around, you know, this is a, uh, the departure board. This is from about a year ago. This is the departure board for a uh, train station in Germany. You can obviously tell from the, uh, from the text. Um, but it's a, you know, just a kind of a sample. Of, it's not your size. I mean, if you're big, if you're small, no matter where you are in the world, um, you're potentially a target for these guys. And it's become mainstream. 
you know, you can see it now in the New York Times. It's not just a computer industry thing anymore. It's, it's becoming into the common awareness. Um, and what we've seen is, you know, from 2019, there were over 200,000 organizations. And these are just the ones that were willing to submit the files, so, you know, submit some of their encrypted files to um, the FBI and to MCSoft and to Checkpoint and to a few of the other security firms that are trying to research ransomware and see if they can develop countermeasures to break the encryption. You know, hopefully they would find that, you know, maybe some type of ransomware used an encryption method with a hole in it. So this is a big number, but it's important to realize that this is kind of the tip of the iceberg. And there's a sharp division between public sector entities and private sector entities here. Private sector entities have some motivation and some ability to kind of keep these things quiet that public sector entities often don't. So, you know, they don't want it to get out that their security let a ransomware attack happen. And they don't want to have the, the you know, the reputation damage of being associated with a ransomware attack. So a public organization can decide to quietly pay the ransom and try to stay out of the papers. A lot harder for uh, um, public sector organizations. So you know, the real number of, of ransomware attacks in 2019 is probably significantly larger than this. The other thing that's been going on, and if you look at the horizontal graph, you can see this is a little over a year, the average ransomware payment made, as is just the ransomware payment, has gone up from under $10,000 to over $84,000 in a little over a year. This is a, a big number, and it's, it's even a bigger number when you consider that the average, the median salary of a programmer in the U.S. is $69,000. So, you know, if somebody is having kind of a mid-career crisis and thinks their career is not going anywhere, there might be a you know, a, a motivation for them to change and um, uh, yeah, go into, go into computer security. That's, that's what they would do. Um, so, it, but it, it's, you know, lucrative. It, it's, it's, you know, very worrying. Um, cities have been hit, cities have been attractive targets. Um, dozens of cities hit last year. Atlanta got hit, um, the Richmond, Virginia got hit. Um, and New Orleans had one of the interesting after effects. They had backups, which was good. But when they started restoring, they discovered it was going to take them weeks to restore all their critical systems and get things put back together. And, and really, you know, if you're an organization, one of the things you need to do is ransomware preparedness is decide which ones are your most critical systems. I was actually reminded of this talking to Doug before we just before we started. I did some consulting work with New York City um, before Y2K. And we were talking, a lot of what we did was like talking about planning for what if the worst case scenario happened and all the computers went down on, at midnight. And they said, okay, there are four things that we need to be able to do if the computers all go for fluid. We need police, we need fire, we need HRA, which is the New York City agency that handles payroll and also handles welfare payments, and we need sanitation. And unfortunately, sanitation, they said, we're not worried about sanitation because they know where the trash is and they know where the dump is and they know where the trucks are. <laughs> they can manage everything for that. But, you know, that was their target of, of you know, if, if we need to start putting things back together, those are the first ones. And that's the kind of plan you need to have um, if, you're, if you're concerned about recovering from ransomware. But segueing from uh, um, New or back to New Orleans just a little bit, this is a purchase order. Um, that came to us on a post-it note, uh, as you can see from the photo from the city of New Orleans, um, asking, you know, buying some equipment from us to help them in a future ransomware situation, but they acted on it, you know, very quickly, and it came on a post-it note because they hadn't been able to get their purchasing systems up. Um, so this is just a very concrete example of the kind of effect ransomware can have on an organization. So looking at kind of who are the targets, um, you know, it breaks down by industry, you know, there's, there's some, some correlation here just between the size of the industry and the number of attacks. Um, but we can see that education is a very attractive target. I mean, education is number three, government is number two. 
again, because of, to some extent, I think because public sector is more likely to pay, it's more likely to become known. Um, and to some extent, I think there's, there's, there's a perception, I'm not sure how true it is, that public sector entities are more vulnerable. And, you know, based on my experience, I think there's a lot of variability in that. It's true of some organizations, uh, not nearly so true of others. We'll talk a little, let me talk, let's talk a little bit about, um, you know, some of the targets that have been hit. And this is, I'm going to focus on mostly the, the slide world, mostly the educational. These are all from 2020. Um, and, you know, uh, I, I sometimes try to play a little, you know, the price is right here and let people, people, people kind of guess, but I think we're a little impressed on time. So I'm not going to do that today, but the city of Lafayette, Colorado, um, paid 45K early in, in 2020. They got off pretty light. Uh, town of Colony, New York, which is about 10 miles south of where I'm sitting, it's right, right in the Albany area, got hit this year. They paid about $100,000. Um, the Albany Airport Authority also got hit last year around Thanksgiving and paid about $100,000. It goes up from there. Maastricht University in the Netherlands got hit, paid $220,000. Uh, University of Utah, $450,000. But the winner for this year, at least on the public sector side, as far as I've been able to find, is the University of uh, California at San Francisco that paid a cool $1.14 million uh, to get their data back. And the other thing about public sector, and, and this is true um, of, of public sector entities and also healthcare entities, is that they typically have a lot of personal information about people. So UCSF was worried about data on their students being exposed. Healthcare organizations obviously have a lot of private, you know, patient data that they're worried about being exposed. And a trend that we're starting to see in ransomware, and it's not happening often yet, but it's starting to, is not just the, the, the attackers encrypting the data and saying, pay us to get your data back. They're also exfiltrating some of the data before they encrypt it, and they're saying, pay us or we will expose your data. Um, to just you know raise the stakes on them a little bit. Now these are all these are actually all kind of small potatoes compared to a couple of that have happened recently in the commercial world. Uh, Carlson Wagon with the travel agency was hit a couple of months ago. They got a demand for ten million dollars. They negotiated down the payment to three point seven million. The large German software company Software AG got hit. I think just last week, it's, it's very recent. And I, you know, I think they're still negotiating. The demand there was $20 million. So we're talking a lot of money in some cases uh, for these things. Um, and, and you know, the attackers tend to you know, kind of scale the demand based on what they think people can pay. Uh, so not everybody's going to get a, a demand for a million dollars, but you know, it's going to be enough that it's, it's likely to hurt. The other thing that's really happened, that was, and this is really scary, is we've uh, had now our first death directly related to a ransomware attack. This happened at a hospital in Dusseldorf, uh, Germany, where the hospital was hit by a ransomware attack that appears to have been intended for a university connected to the hospital and not the hospital itself. And there are a couple of really interesting things about this story. So the death occurred when a patient showed up at the emergency room in an ambulance um, and they couldn't admit or treat the person because all their computers were down because of the ransomware attack. And so they sent the ambulance to the next closest hospital, but the patient didn't survive the extra trip. So that's really scary. The, the, the places where it gets kind of surreal is that the police reached out to the uh, to the attackers, you know, who communicated with the hospital with a ransom demand and said, hey, do you realize you hit a hospital? And the attackers actually gave them the decryption keys without the ransom and, and kind of apologized. Um, and, and this has been a, a, a strange thing. It, it's, it's the way the ransomware industry operates. It's almost like they're concerned about their public image, uh, which is uh, just a, a I, again, it's, it's really, it's a through the looking glass uh, moment for, for, for these things. So some of the other um, 
Uh, and a good question. How does the negotiation of the payment actually facilitate? So the, the ransomware, um, and I'll, I'll get to the payment in a little bit, but the negotiations, um, actually, if you go and Google uh, Carlson Wagon Lit, um, ransomware negotiation, they actually um, did, it was a, like an online chat that they were communicating with the ransomware uh, attackers, and somebody left the chat exposed to the public, and it got snagged and posted to the internet. And it's really fascinating read because it looks like any negotiation in a business deal, except they're negotiating over a crime. And it's just, it, it, again, the word I keep coming back to for this is, is surreal because um, it's almost like, you know, if, you're, if you've read a lot about prohibition and, and the legends of, you know, the stories around Al Capone, he presented himself to the world as an honest, as a businessman. And except for the fact that his product was illegal and he was horribly violent at times, he often acted just like a normal businessman. He set up charities in Chicago to, to feed the homeless and, you know, was concerned about his public image. And, you know, I'm, we're kind of seeing echoes of that in the ransomware world that the, attackers are trying to present themselves not as thugs, you know, as a different image. Um, so, you know, one of the, the other things that's happened recently that's really made the ransomware attacks a lot more um, frequent is there are free do-it-yourself ransomware as a service kits out there. So you don't have to know a lot these days to, um, launch a ransomware attack and I'll, I'll talk a little more more about that but you know that's that's it so you know the world has gotten to be a scary place from this point of view um and it's not slowing down uh you know it is very much a, a cops and robbers you know we're trying to we're you know technology companies are kind of trying to come up with better ways to defend against and recover from ransomware attacks and the guys on the other side are trying to come up with uh um, you know, better ways to do it. It's uh, um, like the classical joke about, you know, the business of technology is coming up with a better mousetrap and the business of nature is coming up with a better mouse. Um, but that's, that's very much, you know, exactly what, you know, where we are. So, you know, uh, I'll say it again, you know, it, it's surreal. It's through the, it's a, it's a through the looking glass world from looking at this from a, uh, a technology and a security person, uh, you know, point of view looking at the way people, the attackers um, are operating. So there's the old joke about, um, you know, they asked Willie Sutton, you know, why he robbed banks and, and his answer was, well, that's where the money is. And there's a lot of money in ransomware, you know, beyond what I showed you before about the average ransomware payout, this is actual um, aggregate worldwide predicted ransomware damages. So this is the ransom paid plus the lost business from time to recover, plus reputation damage, plus sometimes lost data if, if they don't want to pay. And, and you know, they're predict folks are predicting cybersecurity ventures in this case is predicting it'll be over $20 billion worldwide in 2021. That's not a small number. So, how does it all work? You know, how, how do the payments work? So, you know, this is the classic thing, you know, we've all seen the old gangster movies where, you know, you show up with the, the suitcase full of money and, and you get your hostage back and the, everybody or the, or the photographs or whatever. And, you know, everybody, you know, hopefully gets away. This doesn't work in a modern world because the cash is too traceable. And if it's not cash, almost everything else is even more traceable. Bitcoin, on the other hand, is a huge enabler for this because it's a reliable and anonymous payment model. Over 99% of the ransomware demands that are made today are made um, in Bitcoin. And the remaining fraction of a percent is um, in other cryptocurrencies. So this, this is a challenge and it's, it's a funny thing. Um, you know, you may not be familiar with Bitcoin, but the attackers are. So this is really uh, what they go. Um, and yeah, no, a question, uh, you know, uh, have they ever been caught? Can't you trace the payments somehow? Bitcoin was really designed to be anonymous. Um, 
And I don't know of anybody who has ever been tracked um, through a Bitcoin payment. It, it's really, I mean, I, I could, we could do a whole another hour or two on cryptocurrencies and how they work and, and why people use them for these illicit things. But, you know, the idea of anonymous payments was built into to the, to Bitcoin from the very beginning. Um, and, you know, uh, I don't know if you guys are uh, science fiction fans, but as uh, William Gibson said in Neuromancer uh, way back in 1984, the street finds its own uses for things. The guys who designed Bitcoin didn't intend for it to be used for this, but it turned out to be a very useful, uh, you know, a very useful tool for it. So, um, so I already talked about this, uh, and I apologize for, for walking over the slide, but uh, let's, let's look at, this is the ransomware as a service. And this looks like, you know, a, a normal web service application you might go to. And the people running these things, and this is, this is really kind of scary, you can go on the dark web and you can go to this and the folks who run this are, you give them the address of, of who you want to attack, the network address of who you want to attack. You tell them what encryption method you want to use on their data. Um, and enter a, you know, a message for the locker, you know, that's where you put in your, your ransom demand basically. And you put things together and they will launch the attack for you you don't have to know anything about encryption or ransomware or even Bitcoin because these people will actually collect the ransom payment for you. They'll take their cut off the top, which I'm sure they would want to call a commission and they'll give you the remainder. Um, and typical is, is 20% off the top. So this is what I mean of, you know, this is why these things are so widespread because anybody could launch one. The other thing that that means is that, you know, at, for a while you could kind of think, you know, I'm a small organization. Nobody's going to bother hitting me with ransomware. They're going to go after bigger targets. This makes it easy to do kind of a spray and pray attack where you attack everybody you could think of and you hope some of them will pay. And it may just be somebody who knows you randomly or picks your name out of a Google search. Um, so there's no safety in obscurity or being small anymore, um, which is, is really pretty scary. So, um, and you know, this, again, this is ghostly locker. One of the more common uh, bits of ransomware this is their frequently asked questions page. You can go out and, and talk to these people. And they, they actually did, uh, if you notice the, their question now, will it stay public? Once a certain number of public buyers is reached, public registration will be closed again. There have been a couple of cases where ransomware providers like this have publicly said, okay, we're out of business. We've made as much money as we want. We're getting, we're getting out of it. The risk is, you know, we're not gonna take the risk anymore. Um, and, and you buy this by subscription, just like you buy AWS or you buy uh, Office 365. Um, again, you know, I, I keep coming back to the metaphor. It's through the looking glass. It's just like doing business with a software company, except that the product is illegal. This was from um, a pure SEF fellow on my team, actually a guy in Louisiana. Um, and he, before he came to Pure, he worked for a local government and they got hit by ransomware. And this was his story. I talked to him about it. He said he called in, they, they gave a call center number for service. And it was a, somewhere outside the U.S., obviously. Um, and he said they have better customer support than all of the IT companies he dealt with. So these folks were able to explain to somebody who doesn't necessarily know about Bitcoin what Bitcoin is, how do you get Bitcoins? How do you do the transfer? They'll walk you through all of this stuff. It is weird. It's a maturing business model and it's competing with you. And the way it's competing is you're trying to do your normal business. You're trying to do the things that your organization wants to do in life and you need to protect against these guys. So that becomes part of your business. The problem is for most of you, it's not the first thing you think about in the morning. You're thinking about your primary business objectives and you think about security on the side. And I'm not, that, that, that's not intended to be critical or to say it should be otherwise. 
It's a description of the way the world is. And the ransomware guys wake up in the morning and the first thing they think about is, how do I get into more businesses? How do I get into more organizations? So they're directly competing with you. So this has been kind of the scary part of the roller coaster ride. So let's talk a little bit about how, you know, maybe, you know, why you shouldn't panic about these things. Because there are ways that it can be done. So let me take a small detour, because I like to talk about risk. And risk is fun uh, and interesting. And, you know, risk in things is a combination of how likely something is to happen and um, the impact of it if it does happen. And the way those things work out is, you know, they're kind of four, they break into four quadrants. There are things that are not very likely to happen and they're pretty low impact. And for the most part, you know, we pretty much ignore those things. It's like, they don't happen often, so it's not worth doing something to try about them. And if they happen, we'll just fix whatever happened. So, yeah, it's okay. Not a problem. Then there are the things that are pretty likely to happen, and but they're still low impact. Those are like the basic annoyances of life that happen every day. And we develop a routine for coping with those. You know, we either develop, you know, something, uh, you know, we, we learn to, you know, leave our keys in a certain place so we don't have, don't forget where they are and have to go looking for them in the morning. Or we develop a coping strategy for when they happen. Then there's the things that are pretty likely to happen and are high impact. And for these, we have a strategy, you know, we, we get car insurance, we focus on these things because, you know, it's not terribly unlikely that we'll have a car accident at some point, hopefully not a major one, but the impact of it could be very high. So we get insurance, um, health insurance, you know, you're likely to have some health issue in the course of a year, so you get health insurance. Um, so these are all things that we deal with pretty well in, in a variety of ways. The problem is, this guy over here that isn't likely to happen, doesn't happen often, but is a big problem if it does. Because now you're in a, uh, you know, the, these are what we kind of call the black swan events. And these are the ones that we have trouble with because we get wrapped up around, okay, it's not very likely, so how much effort should I actually spend on, um, you know, trying to prevent it? And the impact is big, but it may be hard to measure because it doesn't happen often, so I don't know exactly what it's going to do. So what am I going to do about it? Well, the first thing you can do about it is this. And I do not recommend this, but it is a strategy. It's not a good strategy. Um, so what else can you do? In the case of ransomware, there's some classic recommendations for things. And you're probably all doing this, you know, you're trying to teach your people about phishing emails because that's one of the two main uh, categories that, that uh, of entry for uh, paths of entry for ransomware. The problem with this is as long as I've worked in security and I, I have off and on for 30 years, it has always been true that people are the weak link. Um, way back in the day when I used to talk to people about security, I would tell them if I really wanted, you know, we were, we were selling firewalls to people and, and this was in the early days and people were still trying to figure out, you know, they were about people getting into the organization. I would tell them if I really wanted to break into your organization, I'd apply for a job as a janitor and I'd come in and turn over all the keyboards at night. Because password, people stuck their passwords to the bottom of the keyboard and you'd be amazed how often it happened and you would be even more amazed how often it still happens. I saw it happen less than six months ago in a bank where a teller needed to do some transaction that they needed to do authenticate for. And I saw her turn up, pick up her keyboard and then type her password. It still happens. Oh my God, it still happens. And so we train people. The problem is the training wears off because it's not naturally the way we think. We're not naturally nearly as suspicious as we ought to be from a, from a security uh, perspective point of view, because being suspicious gets in the way of doing other things. And it's really just not a lot of fun. So it's hard to get people to be suspicious for a long period. So you train your people and they all take tests and, and everybody recognizes, you send them test phishing emails and they all spot them and you're all happy. If you do that again in three months, you'll be significantly less happy with the results. I promise you. It's, it's, a, it's an ongoing battle, um, and, and you got to keep putting on new coats of paint. 
Then there's all the technical bits we put in. We make sure our antivirus is up to date. We make sure our patches is up to date. Um, that's a really important one because the other main point of entry for ransomware is remote desktop application um, exploits. Uh, but other exploits you know, follow pretty closely behind. We do packet filtering at our firewalls. We have intrusion detection and intrusion prevention systems. And these are all things that we can do you know, before the attack technical. So these are, these are the prevention sides of things. But you've also got to plan for what if something gets through the prevention. Um, and I always go back to, you know, in a, in a, a much, uh, oh, yeah, no. Um, so the other thing you can do before the attack is, and this is kind of interesting, it's pretty new, is there are people now offering cybersecurity insurance that will pay the ransom if you get attacked. And there are some companies out there doing it. And I mentioned the Albany Airport Authority. They had an insurance policy, and the insurance policy paid their ransom of about $100,000 but they had to pay about 30% of that. So even the co-pays um, in this kind of insurance or deductible, if you will, can be pretty fierce. And, and you know, plus there's all the stuff, you know, if, if you get hit, you, you still have to recover and still have to, to worry about the negotiations and everything. So there's a few things there that you can do. But then the final thing, you know, the, 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 the backdrop of everything else, okay, you've been hit. What can you do? Well, you can pay the ransom. If you don't want to pay the ransom, then the question becomes, do you have a safe copy of your data somewhere? And how quickly can you restore it and get back on the air? So that's where your, your data protection system comes into play. And when you get into that position, that's, that's the part I want to talk about here you know, from, the, from here on out. Complexity is the enemy in this situation. Because if you get hit by ransomware, like most other business continuity and disaster recovery scenarios, these are all those high impact, low probability scenarios. So you haven't had a chance to practice it a lot. And even if you have practiced what you're gonna do, you're not practicing it in real conditions. So you're suddenly going to be doing a process that is unfamiliar, is in a high pressure situation where a lot of people are watching and they want to, and they want it all done and they want it all done now, if not, you know, 10 minutes ago, preferably. And if your um, recovery procedure is complex, the odds of you doing something wrong in the process of doing the recovery and making the situation worse becomes pretty high. So this is where, you know, one of, one of our principles at Pure is simple is smart. And it's a principle that applies enormously in this sort of situation. You need something that is easy and simple to do so that you can recover quickly. This is one of the best advertising uh, campaigns I can remember in quite a while. It's right up there with, you know, where's the beef and things that, have, that, that became just catchphrases. You know, everybody wants to hit the easy button, right? When something bad happens, I got a problem, I wanna hit the easy button. What does the easy button mean in this situation? It means I wanna have a, a solution that is simple, that is fast, and that's reliable. Those are the key things I need. It's gotta work, it's gotta work the first time, it's gotta be fast to get my data back so I can get back on the air, and it's gotta be simple so I don't you know, stand a good chance of making things worse in the process of trying to recover. And so let's talk a little, little bit uh, more about, you know, what that looks like. So in this case, you want something that's simple and reliable. You want it to be easy to set up. You want it to be something you don't have to babysit a lot. You need immutability in it. One of the things that ransomware does these days, is the state of the art in ransomware, is ransomware will sit on your systems for over 200 days on average. And it will snoop. And it will try to get credentials for things. So when it does attack, it can reach as many bits as it possibly can to encrypt the most data it can. That includes your backup store. If your backup store is accessible, it may go out and encrypt your backups. Then what do you do? Well, you need an immutable copy or an air-gapped copy. In the old days, we'd put these things on tape and we'd send them off to Iron Mountain. Today, Iron Mountain is a cloud provider. 
And you can still kind of do that. You can send your data offsite to the cloud, um, but that runs afoul again of, you know, first off, if you bring back that much data from the cloud, there's going to be a big data egress charge from, from your cloud provider. Plus, you're going to be performance limited by how fast is your connection out to the cloud. So if you have a few terabytes of data, you know, how long is it going to take you to transfer that much data down from your cloud provider? So we like the idea of immutability, of, of things that can't be changed. So we provide the capability to take snapshots of your data that can't be encrypted. The, the storage will just, you know, not let it be changed. The other thing is the speed of data recovery. How fast can you bring things back? So ideally you want a very rapid restore and you want to be able to utilize any features that your backup vendor, whoever it may be, um, offers for things like live mounting virtual machines, which can give you, you know, a near zero recovery time objective and data explorers that will help you find the most critical data that you want to bring back first, rather than just having to restore everything as a giant blob. So we like to say, you know, nothing's faster than metadata. So, you know, the first line of defense is snapshots. So this is something that we bring to the table. We're not the only vendor who does it, but I think we do it very well. Um, the idea that on our primary storage, you can use snapshots. They're very fast. They're, you know, full volumes, easily available. They're space saving. They're, you know, as we take a snapshot, the only thing that happens when you take a snapshot is you get a new set of metadata pointing to us, uh, you know, you're basically taking the data and saying, okay, there are two things using this block of data. And only if that block of data gets changed, do we make a copy of the original. So if you had a snapshot and ransomware hit you and it started encrypting that volume, all of the original data would get moved over into the snapshot and then the volume would get encrypted. You could restore the volume from the snapshot Again, thing that takes less than a second typically, and get your data back. This is not a full solution because, you know, people have backup uh, software for a reason. If you did this and you get a bunch of snapshots, if, at some point you get into the problem of, okay, I have like 473 snapshots. Which one has the version of the data I need? And that's that's a real question. And it's, it's a and that's why backup software keeps catalogs and keeps track of versions and things like that. But a lot of backup software can leverage our snapshot capability and index the stuff in the snapshots. So this is a capability that we can provide as a primary storage vendor that helps you, you know, protect with, with your backup software. Second line of defense is better backups. Again, come back to simple, immutable plus, and I'll talk about the plus in a, in a moment, fast recovery and effective prevention. So, this is where we bring in um, our flash blade as a backup target. Now, I'm not going to give you a product pitch about the flash blade, but I will say it's a blade chassis based uh, file and object platform that is highly parallel. So it's a great uh, thing to use for backups because you can have a bunch of backup servers writing to it or a bunch of backup clients writing to it. And the more clients you write to it, the faster it goes which is really neat. And the other, which also means you get that speed when you do restores as well. So we can do tremendously rapid restore on this. And it's also at the same time, a really good platform for things like data warehouses, data link, data lakes, analytics like Splunk and Elastic. Um, so it's, a, you know, this is our backup target. Um, we like to say, you know, it plays well with others. We work with all the main backup vendors. Um, you know, some of the backup vendors will sell tightly integrated storage that works only with their backup. And they like that because it's lock in for them. It makes it harder for you to contemplate changing backup vendors in the future. Um, we don't, in a, don't integrate that tightly with them. So we work with all of them and, um, basically any backup software that can write to an NFS share or an S3 bucket can write to a flashlight. And we also integrate with things like SQL backups and RMAN if you have Oracle, um, in addition to the, the uh, backup, um, you know, the, the larger backup programs. So the plus that we add to this and the immutability plus is a thing that we call safe mode snapshots. So the way safe mode snapshots work, and this is a one-time setup, is, you know, your backup runs and maybe it runs from, you know, midnight until 3 a.m. And then 
afterward, you set your schedule so that at 6 a.m. you take a snapshot of that backup. And so the snapshot runs and completes, and now you have a copy of the data. And so great, you say, I have a snap, I have a snapshot. Well, the snapshot is immutable and it can't be encrypted by the ransomware. But, but you say, what if the ransomware gets a copy of the administrator credentials to the array and goes in and deletes the snapshots? And, and this is some of the ransomware is smart enough to do that. Well, we'll put on it on the array. You have to make an arrangement with pure support. And there's where somebody like me and somebody like John uh, goes in and has to vouch for you to pure support. And we get two people from the customer and they have a passphrase to authenticate who they are. So, and the safe mode snapshots cannot be deleted by a storage administrator. They can only be deleted or the schedule changed by pure support and we'll only do it when two people call in from the organization and authenticate themselves. So it's kind of like, you know, Dr. Strangelove, you know, you have the missile silo and you got two guys with keys that both have to turn the key to launch the missile. So we're, we're you know, using that kind of as a model. Um, so this provides you, you know, a way to give you a better assurance. Now, nothing is foolproof, right? But it gives you a lot more assurance that if you get hit, that you'll have a good copy of your backup data and then your restore process only becomes, okay, I'm gonna restore the snapshot to the file system or the S3 bucket it came from. And then I'm gonna point my uh, backup software at it and I'm gonna start doing restores. So, you know, it's fast, simple, reliable. That's what we're all about. And then looping in a little bit of detection, I mentioned it's also a good platform for Splunk. So a lot of people are using things like Splunk or Elastic to do analysis on their logs to try and detect you know, there's, a, there's an arms race now. You know, the, the ransomware wants to stay on the systems and collect credentials and, and become more effective when it does launch, but it's got to stay hidden the whole time it does that. So there's a lot of research into how can we detect that this ransomware is on the system. And one of the ways that people do that is looking for stuff in system logs that is suspicious. And one of the main tools for analyzing system logs is Splunk. Um, you know, Elastic is another, there's, uh, you know, a few others, but those are kind of the leaders. Um, so Flashblade can be a really good platform uh, because of uh, effectiveness uh, and because of performance for storing your Splunk data on at the same time you're doing your backups to it. So you can have those two workloads on it um, and they go together very well and, and uh, can be used together, so. Um, so that's pretty much what I had. Let me see, take a quick look here in the chat. I know there's at least one other question. Right, somebody, somebody mentioned, in a sense, these organizations are providing unasked for vulnerability assessments. That is absolutely the case. And part of the story, the rest of the story I heard from uh, Eric, the, uh, the pure SE who had uh, gotten hit, uh, was the company, the, the, the attacker, I to say the company, the attackers um, offered, they paid the ransom, and the attackers actually offered, they, they gave them a set of recommendations to help keep it from happening again. They offered literally to go on retainer and do periodic security assessments for them. They were volunteering to be IT consultants for the people who they had just attacked. You can trust us now. Oh, right, yeah. <laughs> well, that's the, that's the other weird thing about it is there's, there's a, a you know, an honor among thieves kind of thing where they, there's been a very high rate of people actually delivering the encryption keys once they get paid. And it's kind of a, um, it's kind of a model where they all know if they don't deliver, people will stop paying the ransom. So it's in their interest, it's kind of enlightened self-interest to actually be honest about how they do things. Um, so that they don't get the reputation when they attack other people of, well, you're not going to get your data back anyway, so why should you pay them? So and it's, it's just, you know, it's hard to wrap your head around. You really have to kind of like, you know, turn around and look at everything from a slightly different angle than you're used to because they do behave in many ways like a normal legitimate business. And yeah, that's just, um, Apart from the extortion. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, yeah, I mean, and there have been a few cases of um, people who, uh, um, rather than encrypting the data, they just wrote garbage to the disk hmm. because that's you know from the outside that's indistinguishable from an encrypted from encrypted data, and they never intended you know they just intended to take the money and run. Uh, but there haven't been many of those. It's, that's really a, a pretty fringe thing. Uh, can we ever find a foolproof way to beat this? Uh, or better yet, do we truly want to? Absolutely, we want to. Um, can we find a fool, foolproof way to beat this? No. No, nothing is foolproof. Um, that's always been, you know, it, it's the classic thing, and it, it's, it's true in security. It's true in any kind of process analysis something is going to be the weak link in the chain, right? Something is going to be, pick, pick an automobile, something is going to be the first part that usually fails. So you make that part stronger. Now the second most common part is the weak link. And you're always going to have something that's your weakest link. What about, uh, speaking of uh, anything we can do, I know there are orgs out there working to Look for the, you mentioned this, I think, uh, earlier, weaknesses in the encryption of the ransomware yeah. and being able to decrypt without paying the ransom. Um, who, who is that again and, and how successful has that been? I, there are a bunch of folks about it. I know MCSoft is one of them. I know the FBI is trying to do it. But it's not been very successful because for the most part, they use standard encryption algorithms like AES-256. And, you know, those are really good algorithms. You know, they, if they, if yeah. they had back doors, people wouldn't use them for legitimate purposes. I was listening to a podcast the other day and they were saying that ransomware as a service, number one, makes it easier for script kitties to just ransomware anybody. But number two is a way of true criminal organizations covering their tracks, because if they make their package public, then it's a common fingerprint and it can't be tracked back to them when they actually do attack the targets they want to attack. Exactly. And, and, you know, the, the Department of the Treasury recently put out a directive that was unfortunately vague. I mean, everybody I know who looks into it, these things is still trying to figure out what it means. But it um, basically kind of threatened sanctions against people for paying ransom if the ransom went back to a known terrorist or criminal organization. The problem is, you know, when you get the ransom demand, it's not it's usually not at all clear to you where it's from. Mm. So if you pay it, you don't know where the money is going. Mm. Um, so I'm not, I'm not sure how much effect that's going to have, practically speaking. Yeah. We have a question in the chat. Would you describe the exploits using remote desktop? You know, there's been a um, lot of IDP research. There, there, there have been a number. Um, you know, I, I, don't, I don't have details on any specific exploit at the top of my head, but, uh, you know, looking into... Again, you know, the people like MCSoft and, and others who do these, um, do the analysis of these things, it's mostly been, um, you know, there, there'll be, people will find a security hole in RDP and the companies issue patches, but the ransomware will be looking for people who haven't, who aren't up to date on the patches and trying to, uh, trying to use the exploits. So, you know, I, I don't have the, I don't have details on specifics, I'm afraid. Any other questions out there? I don't want to keep sucking the oxygen out if people have questions. Uh, feel free to chime in. Yeah. The, the other thing that makes it really challenging, I'll, I'll just uh, say, is, is, you know, it's, it's the classic defender's dilemma, which is, you know, if you're the defender, you have to be right every time when an attack happens. The attacker only has to be right once. So the odds are against you. You know, that's one of the things that makes it tough. Great. So I hope I haven't been Debbie Downer for everybody. I mean, this, this, is, this, is, this is a real thing, and it's a real, you know, concern to worry about. But there are real things you can do about it. And, you know, at worst, there, there are some very real things you can do, and, and we can help you do, um, to recover from it. And you have options other than just paying the ransom. Can you talk a little bit about the economics? I imagine a lot of the difficulties people have in buying one of your blades or any of your other products is uh, they can't justify the cost. Um, and I imagine there's some risk modeling around that too. How do you guys? It, it is. And, and, 
yeah and, and that brings us back to kind of the black swan thing you know it's like um like like i said at the time you know one of the key questions is how much do i want how much effort and money do i want to put into defending against this thing that is you know it's going to happen to somebody but is it really going to happen to me you know mm. and, and 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 what do you think your your chances are so you know you can put together an economic model and you know you know they're, they're not i mean they're all it's all flash storage so it's not you know it doesn't cost two nickels but it's not a million dollars either you know we're not asking people to like you know put uh, uh, an incredible amount of money into this but if you look at you know what is it, it's not hard to do the model if you look at what is it going to cost me if i get hit by ransomware and it uh, you know what would be the difference between taking eight hours to restore my data and taking two weeks to restore my data and how would that affect my business both in terms of you know what direct losses would i have for not being able to operate at that point and what would be the impact of that going forward because people would remember you know i tried to do something with you know this this school this agency this whatever and i couldn't and and i'm you know, really annoyed about it. I'm going to find another way to do it. So there's both the, the immediate impact and there's the longer term impact. The immediate impact is usually a lot easier to quantify. The longer term impact gets fuzzy, which is the other part of um, why it's difficult to, to really do that kind of analysis for these things. Mm -hmm. um, there's, a, there's a lot of places where you really just have to kind of say, okay, this is what I believe is likely to happen and I'm going to plan for that. Nice. Um, so thank you everyone uh, for joining us on our call today. Dave, did you want to say anything or are we? Uh, other than thank you, it was uh, uh, illuminating. Uh, I, had, I had seen a couple of things. I, I would reiterate your comments about them running uh, like, a, like a business and having you know, that level of respect for each other you know, in not wanting their business models to be disrupted, you know, due to somebody not paying, you know, the, you know, or sending the files back. I, uh, I, I certainly know that to be true, and it's a, it's a fascinating piece of the, call it the uh, ethics and crime, yes. <laughs> that uh, that exists. That's 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 absolutely true, and and an interesting facet of this. Um, I think we're, uh, the idea of being always in reactionary mode is something that we do uh, tend to get used to. But one of the things that, uh, you know, I encourage everybody is to never uh, be complacent. Is sometimes you think you fix, you know, or you've shored up a particular, you know, issue or you put in a product that's supposed to take care of the world and you haven't, uh, you know, solved it for, for next week. So this is something we always, always have to be on the, uh, on the lookout for advancing and covering. I will say, Mike, you know, one of the things that's interesting uh, is that when people think about security, uh, whether it's a ransomware subject or anything else, they don't often think about storage, right? So they don't, they don't necessarily jump to vendors of storage. And, and for that matter, don't even necessarily jump directly to vendors of uh, DR, you know, services or business continuity services, they think about going to straight security companies. And, 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 and the idea of going to storage, um, you know, makes entirely, uh, uh, you know, a lot of sense. Um, obviously, as you described it, uh, makes a ton of sense. But again, it's not the first place that people, you know, know to look. Uh, and I think that's an interesting marketing challenge uh, for pure storage or anybody else who's providing uh, these kinds of solutions inside of a, a storage or a DR environment. It, it is. We kind of like to, you know, say, you know, people think about us kind of like plumbing. And, you know, you don't think plumbing is important until you go to flush your toilet. And it yeah. Well, it was funny because, uh, uh, you know, we always say that, um, uh, you know, people are now moving uh, to cloud services. Uh, forgot that there's a network, you know, between the cloud and, and exactly. the site. you know, they kind of forgot that they need this like connectivity to get there and it needs to have certain characteristics and resilience and, 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 that, and that kind of thing. So 
So yeah. we, we have the same kind of interest, but good. Well, thank again, you. Thanks, I, for, I, I, thanks very much. No, thank you for inviting us. And, you know, my, my email has been on the screen here for, for a couple of minutes now. Hopefully if anybody's interested, you've got it down. Uh, if you have questions uh, after, feel free to, to contact me. Um, I actually have a peer who supports uh, all of you folks in Rhode Island um, and it works with John. Um, but, you know, if, if you have technical questions, um, this is kind of a, a pet interest of mine. Um, so if it's you know about security, I can probably answer them. If it's more about pure, uh, we can refer you guys to, to John and Dimitri. And we do do we do have a number of other features that are more general um, disaster recovery business continuity features in our storage that you know we'd love to talk to anybody about if you're concerned about that that aren't specifically focused at ransomware. So cool, great. So thank you everyone for joining us uh, this morning and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you.